Доброго дня, шановні колеги. Good morning, dear colleagues. Welcome to this event of four organizations. Fund for Democratic Initiatives of Ilko Kucher and the Donetsk Institute of Information. We would like to introduce some electrical expertise that we prepared some time ago, and it's about audit of Minsk agreements and possible ways of reintegration of Ukraine. My name is Katerina Zarembo. I reproduce Institute of World Policy, which was one of the partner of this report. I would like uh, to tell you about this uh, research a little bit about uh, it's where we introduced it and, and then we'll move to the presentation of a report of this report and then of possible uh, ways uh, of reintegration and uh, possible discussion. This uh, this was in an initiative of uh, International Fund Renaissance Foundation and other partners and the idea was in the summer. We thought that it would be useful to uh, make an assessment of implementation of Minsk agreements and also in general uh, the conflict according or implementation or non-implementation of these uh, agreements and uh, according to th uh, four parameters, uh, political dialogue, economics, uh, uh, public opinion and uh, humanitarian social situation on occupied and liberated territories. This study that we prepared Together and we discussed uh, all the parts, parts uh, together, and uh, that was a collective work. And everybody was responsible for a certain part, but we participated in the whole document and, and also in the discussions. We uh, made presentations in Brussels, and uh, that was in October. We discussed uh, with uh, people who are responsible for uh, decision taking. Then in November, we uh, took this uh, research to uh, Kramatorsk and discussed it uh, locally with people who live on those uh, pre-front territories with uh, military men and also now in the end of the year we wanted to, to make it a pre uh, the presentation uh, here in Kiev. In my opinion the, the key key focus of this uh, study is about how Ukraine as a state and uh, citizens of Ukraine, how should, should we treat occupied uh, territories in the near future? Because our uh, goal is uh, to re-establish uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine, but we understand that uh, reintegration in, uh, in the next uh, year or two it will not happen. So we would like to discuss what, what we should do now. So I'm I. And I will speak as not as a moderator, but as a, a participant of this uh, study and as the representative of uh, the world of uh, Institute of World Policy. I will give you some. I use. I will use some ideas. And Minsk agreements are not ideal. It's difficult uh, to find people who support them ardently, or not ardently and uh, the consensus on how to implement them. Ukrainian experts don't know. It's very difficult to find the consensus why uh, Minsk agreements are not the ones we would like to have. I mean, um, the plan of peace, because uh, they shift the focus from a country aggressor, I mean, Russian Federation, to the country uh, victim, uh, that is Ukraine. And they suggested to regulate uh, the conflict in, in a way that as if it is an internal conflict. So because the key responsibility and the key uh, actors, uh, uh, Ukraine is uh, responsible for everything. And uh, that is a serial logic, uh, factual shortcoming of uh, Minsk agreements. And the second, which you know uh, uh, quite well, because it's very difficult uh, to uh, implement them because uh, they have different readings. The plan to regulate the conflict should be more detailed, clear, absolutely clear. And we know that those meetings that are taking place in uh, the civic format, they uh, uh, they meant to prepare a, a roadmap and with a clear plan and uh, with a clear 
sequence of what should be done afterward. And when we, when there was a meeting on uh, the level of heads of states in October, and uh, it happened uh, that uh, we had uh, our presentation in Brussels because that our organizations uh, published uh, a document, which was called. Uh, red lines uh, to implement Minsk agreements, and it was about how to implement them in a way for Ukrainian uh, national interest and not to be uh, abused and uh, for the regulation of the conflict uh, to be uh, sustainable for us and not to have escalation. The key idea of those red lines was that security should be the, on the first place and uh, elections are come the last. Elections can take place only after they pulled back the troops and uh, weapons. If uh, control over the border will be done by special international mission, the border should be closed to prevent supplies of uh, ammunition and weapons over the border, and also we should uh, prepare elections according to uh, legislation of Ukraine, and also according to, to Copenhagen criteria, so OSCE, and also there must be a clear algorithm how to hold to those elections and also how to provide the rights for uh, IDPs. So a number of criteria uh, quite uh, quite detailed and in the document. That is based on international experience how to regulate uh, conflicts, how to settle con conflicts. And uh, there is that approach which we suggest uh, to Minsk agreements at the moment. It's very important, and we raise this issue in Brussels that sanctions this against Russia they should not depend on reforms in Ukraine which we hear sometimes, the state, a state has the right for territorial integrity independently on other factors, political or, or dynamics, in, dynamics inside of the country. And uh, that seems very important to term. Sanctions should be connected to implementation of Minsk agreements by both her partners, uh, Russia, first of all, and and uh, they should be directed uh, to uh, taken back, getting back uh, total integrity. Now I'll give the floor uh, to uh, Ima Solohub, research fellow at Kiev School of Economics, uh, Vox Ukraine. I'll speak about the economic part of the uh, of uh, the conflict. First of all, I'd like to introduce the study which shows something that we knew, but it is confirmed with uh, the data that we collected uh, from social networks, from media, on uh, violence in, on those uh, territories that were uh, under occupation. And uh, Yuri Zhukov uh, from Michigan University, he is a researcher. He was uh, trying to find independence where in which towns or cities or villages uh, cases of violence were more possible or more probable. On the left, there is a language map on the map on the conflict of uh, violence. We came out that a uh, language uh, factor explains to us such cases, but if we take the map of economic uh, a map or employment map, and uh, also industry, mining, mining sector, and uh, metallurgy. We found that uh, the biggest probability of the conflict in, is in those villages or towns where the majority of the population is uh, busy in the machine building industry. That can be explained in a way that uh, f at the beginning of the, of the conflict, the markets of the Russia for that uh, product were closed to other markets. Other markets uh, didn't ex didn't take uh, the, the products they produced. And so economic value of the uh, is going down for the people who um, live on conflict in uh, territories. When they lose their job, 
it's easier for, uh, to hire them to to go to the war, and if there is someone who who is paying for that, that it shows why we need to have reforms. If we, if people have an alternative, then it will reduce uh, the probability of uh, participation in the conflict, and also that explains uh, that uh, program, the program return home. That, that is the state program, and uh, that is a useful program for to reduce the tension in the region. Consequences. It's clear that we lost uh, from 15 to 20 percent of GDP as a result of the conflict, and uh, but it's impossible to uh, to give you a precise number. One of the consequences, which is both positive and negative. Positive is that we lost uh, a big res uh, there is a big uh, reduction of uh, Russian products in our uh, trade, especially gas, and also a big reduction of uh, the volume of foreign trade. And uh, it's clear because on occu the occupied territories we have uh, big metallurgy enterprises and other enterprises. impacts on uh, all of us. So we lose, uh, we lose uh, taxes and also we pay more from the state budget uh, for short term and for long term to defense. And it's clear that in the f in future payments uh, from the budget uh, related to the conflict will grow because uh, the uh, defense uh, payments will grow and also will uh, payments to participants of uh, the war will grow and also we need to, to help IDPs. And when those uh, when those uh, territories are integrated to Ukraine, it will take a lot of money to uh, rebuild the infrastructure. And also now they we need that to reestablish the infrastructure in those regions that were captured uh, in 2014, in the summer, then uh, then uh, later uh, they were liberated, and that creates additional uh, source of corruption, that separation line. It and also the risk uh, for uh, for investors is is growing up. On the other hand, according to the poll among uh, foreign investors, uh, the conflict uh, is only the third. Uh, obstacle for investments uh, to Ukraine after corruption and will trust uh, to the judiciary. So, there's a saying, with such friends uh, we don't need enemies. We know quite well how we have, how we fight corruption, how we reform uh, the judiciary, and we understand why our European and other partners, uh, partners uh, emphasize that it's necessary to have reforms. Thank you. I give the floor to my colleague. Good afternoon. I'm Maria Zolkina, political analyst of um, initiative named after Ilka Kucherev, and our organization studies public opinion. And starting 2014, one of the main topics is surveys. Uh, how the people assess uh, the uh, probability of um, uh, these conflicts at the, the frontline areas, and also uh, the, we study the situation in the controlled territories of uh, Lugansk and Donetsk Oblast. And after our discussions in Brussels, this internal factor and uh, public opinion about possible scenarios of this conflict it was even more important uh, from foreign audience because we know, we understand how our society react on this conflict. And maybe people in other countries, they now start to understand this year uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable for Ukrainians, for the majority of society, and what can be the consequences if some political or diplomatic decisions will be taken, um, if it, uh, this decision does not take into account the opinion, the public opinion. And now 
we have uh, formed picture uh, on the attitude of people towards situation in Donbass. And uh, first, there's no request for peace at any price. Half of population, they believe that Ukraine should choose compromises in the framework of diplomatic negotiations. These compromises and uh, trying to find the ways how to resolve this conflict through agreement is the main area. Uh, Ukrainian believe the state should uh, focus on this, trying to find the way out of consequences of this conflict. And 48% uh, of population believe that compromises should be not about everything, that Ukraine should select these compromises. And at the end of 2017, this um, approach to compromise, it prevails uh, and uh, uh, it prevails in public opinion of uh, pre frontline Danichina and Luganshina last autumn in the territory of controlled um, by state and Donetsk and Lugansk oblasts. They believe that Ukraine should accept any proposals just to restore peace. And now 49% of controlled uh, parts of Donetsk and Luganshina, they believe that we should select the um, uh, the uh, compromises. And also, my colleague uh, Katerina Zaremba mentioned this, that first, there should be security and political part of any documents, including the Minsk agreements. And uh, uh, public opinion shows that the main recipe for peace, the main decisions on which uh, Ukraine and international partners should focus in order to restore peace in the territory of Ukraine, there should be further pressure on Russian Federation in order to force it to stop these aggressive actions. And uh, um, the majority of population, 41%, says that this is the main decision, uh, group of decisions the, uh, we should focus on both Ukraine and international partners. The second argument to support this position uh, to guarantee security first and then go into political part of uh, mutual agreements. This is the increase of uh, op public opinion, uh, support of public uh, support of population of the idea of international contingent. So if uh, for diplomats this is really questionable whether it is realistic in the nearest future to carry out this mission uh, the public should uh, the public has a positive attitude towards such contingent uh, in the territory um, and uh, many Ukrainians have positive attitude to the uh, introduction of such conti uh, contingent. Last year it was 30, uh, 52, now it's more. And in the control territory of Donbass, there is increase of positive attitude towards this idea. And last year, last fall of 2015, 68% of Donbass residents had negative attitude about international contingent, and no, no 16 positive, and now positive 36. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the negative attitude decreased, and more people started to view uh, po uh, this uh, prospect as positive. Uh, so political provisions of the Minsk agreement, they are viewed, uh, taking into account some considerations. And uh, uh, if we are speaking about, about public at large, um, people believe that they are not realistic because there won't be any elections in the territories. And more than 40 percent of Ukrainians believe that there shouldn't be elections. And among those who believe that elections can take place in the occupied territories, um, 
So they want that this process be properly regulated and these requirements coincide with uh, what Ukrainian experts say, the militarization of occupied territories and um, full adherence uh, to Ukrainian legislation and uh, international observation of the electoral process. And the less realistic um, idea is that Ukraine can restore control over its border with Russia. So these are four conditions that are the most uh, supported by those Ukrainians who believe that these elections are possible. So, and uh, taking into account these four uh, points, we can say whether this idea, the preparation for some law on elections in occupied territories, political future of the uh, t uh, uncontrolled territories, it is obscure, and 70% believe that uh, uh, these territories cannot have uh, uh, some um, benefits when they are returned to the state, that uh, they shouldn't be given this, some preferences over other territories. And this position, so they should not have any other um, uh, preferences. And, uh, People, uh, even 42% uh, of Danish uh, and Lugansk that are under governmental control, they believe that there shouldn't be any broadening of responsibilities and preferences. They should just go back to the um, under the control of the Ukrainian government. So. Um, uh, during 2015 and 2016, we have such a picture how Ukraine should act as a party that take part in the regulation of this conflict that uh, will face the consequences of uh, some diplomatic and political decisions and uh, these results, they are internal red lines and we should pay attention to it. If in 2014 and the first part of 2015, at the beginning of 15, uh, when Minsk II was signed, uh, they tried to uh, motivate people and to have some uh, painful changes. And now it can even uh, restart so some um, uh, internal troubles. So it can, uh, there can be some protests and even more split in political elites. So some negative things that can weaken both society and the state in the situation. Now I give the floor to Vitaly Sizov, the analyst of uh, Donetsk Institute of Information. So we discussed international issues and public opinion. The Minsk process is oriented on such factors, some internal uh, uh, foreign policy elections and uh, Humanitarian issues are at the back burner and uh, they should be resolved because there are many questionable issues. And uh, Donetsk region in the course of this conflict split in two areas and this region was formed as a, um, a unit and if we are speaking globally this is not only about Donbass it is about Ukraine on the whole so this part is integ was integrated in all Ukrainian systems the system of healthcare education media um, freedom of movement and this uh, line of confrontation because of this line all parties suffer and in our part of research we took into account several aspects of health care and in the result of the conflict it happened so that uh, all medical institutions of the third level of provision of medical help they are in Donetsk and people who are now in controlled territories they are now restricted in getting these medical services in order to go to a center for treatment of burning or oncology. They should search for a hospital in different region or a person who is in controlled territory can go to the territory of uncontrolled, uh, to the uncontrolled territory in order to get some medical services. 
So there is heavy burden on medical institutions as a result of the military actions, and uh, uh, also uh, because they should uh, uh, help those who were wounded uh, to the military. So no one expected that some hospitals in small towns uh, will be turned into medical hospitals. So some resources are allocated there. And uh, uh, also in uncontrolled territories, there was a problem previously that uh, the uh, militant group members, they refused to uh, have some tests for HIV, for example. We don't know why. And now the situation is uh, better, but there is information that there is there was um, in controlled territories and in non-controlled territories. So we have data about a situation in uh, controlled territories, and we do not know the situation with uh, health care uh, in uh, territories that are not controlled. So uh, we have problems in the sphere of education. There was a policy of uh, a part the evacu evacuation of um, educational institutions, and uh, it uh, wasn't really successful. Part of um, educational institutions uh, moved, and part of uh, students who studied in uh, Donetsk, they do not want to uh, go to frontline areas because uh, the situation is unpredictable there. That's why they chose uh, the uh, institutions of Kiev, Kharkiv, Zaporizhia, or they go to Russian Federation from uncontrolled territories. In schools and uh, higher educational institutions, uh, many uh, in frontline area, it happens so that uh, teachers, they um, teach several different subjects, for example, physics, mathematics, and the physical culture are taught by one teacher. And uh, uh, also, for example, in uh, controlled territories, there is a policy of United Ukraine, and in um, uh, non-controlled territories, they build separate identity, and it can negatively affect the uh, process of reintegration. Uh, the freedom of movement, it is restricted. Uh, despite this, uh, the line of confrontation is crossed by more than 20,000 people. And in, 20, in uh, August 2014, in one month, uh, um, uh, uh, 875,000 people crossed uh, the line of uh, confrontation. And uh, we see that the uh, links remains. So also there are two separate ideological systems. If we take non-controlled uh, territories, so all the media are there, they are in the structure of the Ministry of Information, and they uh, work in one, one ideological vector. And uh, uh, and um, in ATO area, the situation is so, and it ref it affects the media, and not all the journalists are ready to highlight information um, in a proper way. Uh, for example, about the behavior of uh, Ukrainian servicemen or uh, military units on the whole. Now we go to the part with the um, possible scenarios. And I would like to stress that we have the aim, our final goal as the authors of this report. We want full integration, reintegration and restoration of uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine and the scenario we are speaking about. We are speaking about uh, uh, the nearest future. Uh, of, of this uh, reintegration, and we prepared s uh, six scenarios, two of them um, concerning what can be done, how to use this the Minsk agreements, and four scenarios. This is internal scenarios uh, about cooperation with the occupied territories. And none of the scenarios is more preferable or more probable. We just want to show that there is no ideal scenario, and each scenario ha has its benefits and drawbacks, and we want to discuss it with you. 
so as to for an aspect and uh, also working in the framework or out of the framework of the Minsk Agreement. In the first part of my report, I sp uh, told you about drawbacks of the Minsk Agreement, but there are some uh, benefits and good sides. So they invited to negotiations about the conflict the mediators, uh, France and Germany and these mediators, they are not neutral. They support Ukraine in this conflict. And uh, they provide an instrument that show who aggressor is. So this is sanctions. These are against Russian Federation, and they are connected with the implementation of the Minsk agreements. And accordingly, what Ukraine can get or lose if it rejects the implementation of Minsk agreements. First, the coordination of this document was uh, connected with uh, some uh, negotiations with international partners and uh, Rege unilateral rejection would uh, um, create mistrust uh, and, um, to Ukraine as a partner, and it could lead to the cancellation of sanctions, because if there is no mixed agreement, so the sanctions are not needed in this case. And we know about elections that will take in uh, 2017, uh, the elections in Germany and France, and uh, the rejection of Minsk agreement will uh, show some political, uh, some vacuum. And uh, uh, those who want to reject Minsk agreements, and uh, uh, they say that a new agreement can be better, maybe, but there is no guarantee, and you, uh, Russia can use the situation in order to restore escalation and uh, seize new territories, as it happened during the signing of Minsk I with Minsk II in order to strengthen the negotiation position. As concerning the work in the framework of the Minsk Agreement, here we have uh, benefits and drawbacks. From one side, Ukraine gets support of uh, its Western counterparts, and from the other side, it is important to understand that Ukraine is now in search of some creative decision, demonstration that it does something to implement Minsk agreement. And point one, the ceasefire, it is not implemented. And Ukraine is, some, in, is in some trap. Ukraine tries to show that they try to implement Minsk agreement. And uh, so uh, this uh, space for creative um, actions, it can uh, just expire. Uh, and the most important is that implementation of Minsk agreements in a, in a hurry with that critical agreement of, uh, on every detail and involvement of the society, according to any uh, discussion and also taking into consideration uh, the opinion that can be a mine of slow action for Ukrainian government, Ukrainian authorities, also for the state and for the society. I will give the floor to Vitaly. He will speak about the internal scenario. Yeah, I will speak about uh, one of the scenarios, internal, that uh, it's quite possible of uh, complete isolation, which is uh, uh, which is promoted uh, by some uh, political forces and it has a broad uh, support. First of all, because it uh, provides uh, quick solutions, easy solutions, with uh, complete isolation of uh, not controlled uh, territories, uh, um, seeds of economic uh, relations, and also um, seeds of payments. And there is an opinion that will allow to reduce the tension from Ukrainian budget, from the social system. It will allow Ukraine to focus on internal reforms which will give positive uh, something pos positive results in the future and U ukraine will become an example for un un uh, not controlled territories and uh, and it can be a factor of uh, successful reintegration or russia russian federation will have to take those uh, territories on its control and it will influence on its economic uh, well-being and it will weaken the russian federation that scenario 
can sound attractive, but it has a lot of risks because the li separation line uh, 500 kilometers and uh, tension all the time. It's not a fact that the Russian Federation will, re will stop uh, further destabilization. It will not uh, that there will be no tension, as um, the Speaker on Economic Party told that uh, the war is uh, bad for all. For It's a problem for all uh, and for investments, and it's a fact uh, which restricts economic growth in Ukraine. Plus, a refusal from uh, some of some citizens and uh, of our responsibility for them that will have a reputation risk for Ukraine. And uh, some, and in the eyes of uh, our citizens, and uh, so some of those uh, uh, citizens will be di disappointed in the state of Ukraine because we will refuse them. We will declare them that they become uh, victims of occupants, and we refuse any communication with them. And also that will uh, have influence on international perception of Ukraine as a reliable partner, as a state, which. Uh, which meets its uh, social promises and promises uh, to its uh, citizens. I will tell you about scenario of restricted isolation, which is uh, which we have now. This is uh, some kind of a very Ukrainian way. It it is called somehow it will happen. So everybody is trying to postpone the moment of a decision, of taking a decision. And uh, as uh, Ilya Muromets, who, told, uh, who looked at the left, uh, that he would lose uh, his horse, and if he goes uh, to the right, he would lose uh, something else. But he decided to stay there. But we can stay here, but it's not for long, and uh, it's not uh, a good scenario. If we are planning reintegration of those territories, then we need to move to integration. And uh, Maria Zulkina will tell you about uh, other two scenarios. What is happening now, it, it creates uh, the biggest number of uh, people who are unhappy in our society. People who would like to isolate it on bus, and they're not happy that there is a trade with them, with occupied territories. And also it's a shadow, it's in shadow economy. People who who have relatives in uh, Donbass, some occupied territories, who would like to integrate uh, those uh, territories, they're not happy. That those uh, 20,000 people who cross uh, the separation line, they have to be in lines uh, many hours. And, and that is also a part of negative attitude. People who received uh, payments on occupied Territories, and we know that uh, they live there, but they register on uh, not occupied territories. They have to go and take pick that uh, payment, so that the scenario of doing nothing maybe it's attractive for uh, politicians uh, to to shift the responsibility or decision to someone who will be in the future. But for the society, this is the scenario which uh, creates a lot of uh, uh, the biggest number of unhappy people. And uh, uh, if partial isolation is focused, uh, first of all, it um, it allows uh, to restrict uh, contacts and uh, with occupied uh, territories and uh, to influence on the dip diplomatic negotiation process. Very related to this is the scenario, which is called a partial normalization. I mean, it is uh, provides some restrictions, but it uh, underlines that uh, the state will uh, make uh, more efforts uh, to build uh, contacts with uh, occupied uh, territories and uh, taken. As a given, the license is a personal line and that also that it cannot function completely on uh, the occupied territories. If such a scenario becomes practical, it means that under these conditions, uh, then the state is uh, trying to regulate uh, the, the situation. Uh, it can simpl simplify the process of uh, passing this uh, through the separation line. It can improve uh, conditions on uh, those uh, checkpoints between o occupied uh, uh, territories and, uh, and Ukraine. To decide 
and in, in, in different uh, isolation scenario and also it can support some social economic uh, or trade relations uh, with uh, some enterprises on uh, occupied territories. If that scenario is uh, chosen as uh, for state policy, that probably the, the, the biggest trends, but also it's a very doubtful thing, is an effort to, to, show, to, sh uh, to show that uh, the state uh, does what it can as to its citizens and they can count on the state, on the, even if they are on occupied uh, territories. So they count on short-term prospects, and uh, so if there are some uh, political conditions uh, for, to return them to the jurisdiction of Ukraine at some point, that will simplify the transition from, from those uh, self-announced, uh, uh, self-declared Formation to Ukraine state, but uh, such basic scenario has a lot of advantages and disadvantages. The main thing is to strengthen or improvement relations with occupied uh, the occupied uh, territory provides uh, requires uh, quite close contacts with uh, self-declared bodies of power on uh, on the occupied territories and also de facto even. They that we want to uh, get the hearts of people that will freeze the situation because that there, will, uh, there are two systems of power and uh, there are two different uh, groups of actors legitimate Ukrainian authorities and self declared uh, authorities which will be a partner to implement uh, initiatives and um, for Ukraine to uh, to meet its uh, commitments to the citizens of Ukraine on those territories and also even positive steps. Uh, Ukraine as, a, as the state is taken or can take for its citizens on the occupied territories. It's very difficult to, to uh, reach uh, adequately when there is a f complete absence of control over information and which is quite different between Ukrainian media and uh, all those media on occupied uh, territories. And also the scenario of uh, effort, efforts of reintegration, maximal reintegration of the uh, territories and uh, complete uh, isolation and reintegration now and uh, here. Those are two extremes, the least uh, possible options on the table where we choose uh, how the state uh, machine can work. And all the risks and uh, disadvantages with under partial normalization and better relations. Uh, when we try to reintegrate those territories without the previous conditions, we get internalization of that uh, situation and then we turn it into an internal uh, space and uh, we'll just have contacts with uh, those uh, self-declared uh, authorities and we'll legalize them in fact and it doesn't matter how well it will be late and uh, uh, late in change of the state system of Ukraine federalization or not federalization but it will be that it it formative relations between the central government and local authorities will be changed and that's why to try at any cost uh, to return to bring back those uh, territories and also the efforts uh, to is isolate them under these conditions they uh, those are extremes and uh, they are least uh, realistic and uh, the best uh, scenarios by is probably in the middle which will be mixed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will continue as a moderator. And we are ready for, if there is any comment or question, we are to please good, good morning. I would like to congratulate you with St. Nicholas Day and I wish uh, it bring peace and well-being to our country. Congratulations.
Dear friends, as a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, since the first day when we joined the Council of Europe, we prepared um, with Boris Alinik uh, all the documents on uh, on membership in the Council of Europe. What is the, uh, the Council of Europe? You know, it's uh, 47 countries of European countries. They are members of the Council of Europe, and uh, in in European Union they have 28 countries, only uh, 28, and. As the member of the uh, Parliamentary Assembly, for 10 years I was a member of uh, the deleg Ukraine delegation. Also now we have a delegation too to, to that body. I made a statement, 116 statements in the Council of Europe and uh, on different issues. I have a book and I, can, I will give it to you. It was published by the Council of Europe, but and those issues that you discussed here and uh, we should uh, discuss them in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe because uh, the Parliamentary uh, Assembly, four times a year, they have a s four times uh, a year they have a, a session. Forty-eight, forty-seven countries of Europe participate. And you speak about the annexation of Crimea. What kind of annexation of Crimea? Well, if uh, the Parliament of Crimea made a regulation, passed a regulation that uh, to go to join Moscow and uh, to be for the Republic, to be a part of Russia, and uh, they, the delegation came back and we were silent. What, what, what was that betrayal or what? It was a betrayal. So we. So we should find friends in a side of our country and then outside. So I want to tell you, my proposal is for us to raise this issue using the Council of Europe in uh, in January on January twenty fifth with the meeting of the parliamentary assembly will have a delegation but who is in that delegation look they don't they don't speak that's a very important issue i want to raise if you agree i go to the parliamentary assembly as a as a member i don't have the right to vote but i can uh, take any documents and on focus we didn't have it if we didn't raise that issue in the, in the Parliamentary Assembly. European Bank of Reconstruction and Development did everything for the Sofocus to be built and all, but there are some problems there. If you give such an agreement, I can work on this and I can raise this issue and I can raise you, I can take one of you and we can, and then 47 countries will hear us. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. UBA, UBR channel. In your opinion, how long, for how long will we have such a situation in the East? And uh, there are some other opinions. If the US gets involved directly, it will. Maybe that can help. Also, some people believe that representatives of occupied territories will work on this. That can change the situation. What can it happen? Can it help? Let's uh, let's have some other questions. My name is Anna Lavrenta. I represent a youth uh, organization, Six Power. One of the uh, provision providing humanitarian assistance, that's one of the agreements. That's why I have this question. I would like to find out from you on which level students who would like to participate in humanitarian assistance in the East, how they are involved. Can this process be intensified? Thank you. Other questions, comments?
I will try to answer your question. That's two involvement of uh, militants to the negotiation process. What's your idea? Now Europe participates in, in the efforts of uh, efforts uh, to to find a solution. Not big actors like the U.S. You ask about the other conflict and how long it can last. I can tell you this: this international e experience of uh, settling of con conflicts uh, shows that to prepare elections after a complete complete ceasefire without violation uh, or abuse. It, it takes uh, two or three years. It's uh, this is the time to prepare for elections, and we should remember about this, and uh, we should inform our foreign partners about that. It's not just a calendar. It's a, it's, uh, we need to, to build information space, and also political parties of so Ukraine should uh, develop their structures there and uh, so we need two three years after complete ceasefire as to the u.s participation in the process there is uh, quite a high possibility in 2017 that after elections there will be some other representatives uh, in uh, this uh, group and France, uh, which participates uh, in a Normand uh, project. Will the US participate uh, directly in the Normand uh, process? We will see that in 2017. Everybody is watching nominations in uh, the US and it's too early to speak about uh, the participation. As to invi invited militants uh, to the uh, peaceful uh, settlement, the answer is uh, under facilities so that are under the control of Russia that uh, violate legislation of Ukraine, and they uh, participation they cannot participate in uh, negotiations in. Uh, uh, with Ukraine. I would like to add, from international experience, if we have such conflicts uh, are supported by um, a third party, in this case uh, by Russia, uh, usually it lasts uh, as long as there is uh, so such a support. To hope that something happens uh, to Putin, that Trump does, uh, does something to him, I don't know. We could hope, but I doubt uh, such hopes can come true in the near future. That's why I believe that the situation with uh, participation of Russia in this uh, conflict will not change, and uh, we should. That's why we should start with that, and uh, we should think what we can do under such conditions. In fact, uh, those uh, three party pro 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 militants that don't belong to that group, but representatives of uh, DNR, LNLR, they are in subgroups, and. There are some subgroups, but the meetings, those, that work is difficult. In this format, to solve some humanitarian local issues, uh, we could do that. And uh, like an economic subgroup, like uh, to fix uh, the gas uh, line. Not like global issues, like an is um, amnesty or some political issues about how to uh, make uh, life uh, normal. That is uh, probably possible. I don't know what how students can participate, and, and there are a lot of organizations through which you can, students can participate in humanitarian assistance as to. There could be, we can think, there are many options how long it can last, but nobody doubts that this, this conflict is, will last until we have 
diff different conditions because we are in a dead corner because of this the status quo when one party has its own uh, requirements uh, to I mean conditions of Russian uh, Federation it's not ex they are not acceptable for us uh, for Ukraine and it means that we agree to freeze the situation not in a classical way it's not a classical free frozen conflict it cannot be like that in the near future but uh, nevertheless it says suspension of the situation and this is what we have now like we agree with what we have now separation light uh, line and we agree to the status uh, quo until something changes in uh, the negotiation positions so the main risk maybe it's not internal because now in ukraine there is understanding that uh, there will be no quick return. It can happen only after some price. Ukraine have, has to pay for that. But the risks, uh, there are external risks because despite uh, involvement of uh, negotiators from France and uh, Germany in general, in the pool of international partners of Ukraine, in my opinion, there is no readiness. I to understand that uh, this is uh, this can happen. That uh, the situation can be frozen for the for the coming three, five, seven years. The task of Ukrainian Ukraine Ukraine to under, to explain if conditions. Uh, on the basis of which we are trying to get agreement, and it means that we will have this situation like now and we should start we should think how we can optimize it and we can optimize it if we form it a poor policy of ukraine has had to occupy territories for us had to have at least uh, losses for us as a, as a, as those uh, that were provides resources to our citizens and also we should not lose in the negotiation process and also no, not to lose the battle uh, diplomatic battle of re-establishing uh, territorial integrity of Ukraine. Thank you. I would like to ask whether we have time for one question. Yes, we have time. I have several specifying questions. First, we understand that in half a year there will be elections in Germany and France. What Ukraine can do in this half year in order to establish proper communication with these countries and to strengthen its positions. And next question. For example, tomorrow there is some reintegration of the territories and uh, there can be some temporary administration whether it should be joint administration that should consider and review the situation what should be done in this area concerning administration concerning power and uh, another aspect is ideology so the status quo It creates the situation that the new identity is created that uh, opposes Ukrainian identity. Whether these people can um, really communicate and establish proper ties among themselves after reintegration. Any other question? So the last one, maybe. But time I think it was um, Ima Salahuk who mentioned um, the public support for an international contingent, the increase of public support. Could you, I'm not sure who, who it was Maria Zolkina, yes. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, could you specify what do you mean with this international contingent? Thank you. Thank you. I believe that this topic of election is the most painful. People who study this issue, the scenarios, 
and the experience of the Balkan states, Kosovo, uh, UN Interim Administration and OECE uh, carried out an actions and the Council of Europe supervised and uh, I also was in, uh, um, in th there was supervision by OECE in the Balkans and uh, there was some le uh, legitimization of the elections and uh, these ideas are not discussed in the um, Minsk, uh, uh, not at the level of experts, uh, not in subgroups, so maybe uh, it is interesting whether you studied this experience, and maybe we should focus to uh, maybe these elections, they uh, should involve OECE and other important international organizations. I would like to answer the question about Germany and France, how to carry out negotiations with them. I would say that our best communication is reforms. So everyone is tired of um, this uh, uh, situation and uh, we should have success story. The reforms of army and other areas, uh, we will benefit from reforms in different area. And uh, um, second, Ukraine should communicate with its partners it shouldn't wait, and uh, we should identify our partners in all political forces who take part in political life of uh, Germany and France. We should communicate with them, even those who are not natural partners of Ukraine or not accustomed to um, communicate with Ukraine. And as to Mr. Truchen's question about OECE, I'm not an expert on legislation on elections, but I would like to say that in my opinion, of course, we need monitoring of elections and their legitimization of international partners. And uh, the Balkan state uh, experience shows that if you carry out elections, if international partners are interested in uh, elections and uh, um, in uh, to make these uh, ele uh, elections legitimate, uh, of course we should involve different types of observers, both international and foreign. Uh, this we should uh, discuss this issue in more detail. I believe that first I will continue. Ukraine should get prepared. Today we have less international attention to Ukrainian and Russian conflict. Two years ago we believed that we will be in the spotlight and top uh, and uh, now we see that the interest decreased and we should uh, take all the measures in Europe and uh, uh, in the United States and uh, uh, for this half year of sanctions and uh, we um, we have some rhetoric in Europe they say that uh, you should do something one two three in order that we could explain to our politicians and to our um, people uh, why we should uh, continue the sanctions and uh, so there is such communication with the Ukrainian side and uh, uh, the debates about continuation of sanctions so this pressure may be stopped and uh, um, the EU uses its methods in order to influence the uh, Russian Federation about the reintegration of territories and uh, ideology. I believe that as of today, the factor of this uh, gap, the risk that we lose hearts and minds of people in that territories. Uh, it is over exaggerated. We have conflict for two and a half years and this is not only conflict, this is separate political and ideological and information environment. We do not have influence in this environment. 
And in my opinion, there is a gap between understanding of the situation that is today and attitude to some sensitive things. This attitude is different in controlled and the territories that are not controlled by the state. That's why maybe I won't have much hope that we will be able to change the attitude of people who live in non-controlled territories, even after in some way control will be restored over these territories. So this will be a reintegration process. It is in the, uh, I mean, social reintegration, humanitarian reintegration, the attitude towards some things. It is in the phase when it is really difficult and it will last for years after Ukraine uh, is able to completely restore its jurisdiction over the territories and the experience of pre uh, front line areas shows this uh, because in that territory is, uh, there are contradictory views and uh, where we do not have Ukrainian media it is a different story population uh, continue to demonstrate negative attitude towards Ukrainian state and loyalty to self-proclaimed republics and they consume information from Russian media or separatist uh, TV uh, media and uh, uh, even there is Ukrainian if there is Ukrainian power uh, even in that places it is difficult to change the attitude in this two and a half years uh, uh, even in the places where Ukrainian power was uh, was restored. So with that territory, it will be even more difficult. Uh, so we cannot hope for quick change, quick change of the attitude. And uh, um, about the return of this territory to Ukraine, there is international experience and uh, it would be better if, for example, uh, in Minsk agreement, it is stated uh, that after ceasefire, there shouldn't be elections first, there should be a temporary administration first. But uh, it, there is no understanding on this issue I among the experts, and uh, also there is no decision what will happen to the Minsk package. and. Uh, in what, uh, how we will really implement this document and how we will uh, reintegrate these territories. I believe that uh, elections cannot be the first phase after ceasefire established. But uh, we don't know whether we will be able to, uh, for example, use these temporary administrations. I believe that there should be temporary administration, uh, as in those regions that are now under control of Ukrainian side in that frontline regions. So uh, this is an efficient instrument of manage, uh, of administration under such conditions. I would like to say that I have different views. Maybe they are milder. I believe that uh, 20,000 people cross the li line daily and uh, there is no dissonance and uh, uh, the conflict in the territories, it is viewed differently by the participants of the conflict. The volunteers who help Ukrainian army from Marienka, they can go to Donetsk and go to Aqua Park and then go back. and. Uh, those people who are in the militant groups, they you, you face the situation that the attitude is not hostile. They believe that people are just stupid and that went there. It doesn't mean that we will fight until the end. This is first. And second, I believe that we should consider this issue more broadly in the context of uh, Ukrainian and Russian conflict and the polarity of interests throughout Ukraine concerning a uh, foreign vector of Ukraine because uh, uh, there is no consensus in Ukrainian society and surveys show that for the majority of population uh, there are many 
uh, concerning issues and uh, uh, who is aggressor, and we should start the dialogue not in the Donetsk Oblast, but in the framework of the whole state to find our place and how to resolve this conflict uh, in order that everyone participate in this process. And uh, the surveys show that compromise, many people are ready for compromise, but the price of compromise is important. And what Ukraine can do and uh, what Ukraine is ready to do to resolve this uh, uh, pro problem, we should not oversimplify these things. We should understand the uh, what people uh, want and uh, some regions were oriented towards Russia and it is difficult to convince a person uh, if, for example, the enterprise uh, was closed and he became unemployed. We should understand that a person who declares some pro-Russian position, he is, uh, for Russian language, it is not some factor of nationalism. Maybe this is some pragmatic position, uh, some pragmatic reasons involved, not some uh, about uh, international contention. We formulate this question in surveys, whether you support the introduction of international peacekeeping contingent. We do not specify, we do not go into detail who will be in this contingent or under the auspices of which organization this contingent can be formed um, and to the uh, countries who will participate. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in the middle of 2015, we asked whether you support the introduction of international peacekeeping contingent uh, into Donbass. Uh, so uh, what representatives should be there? And uh, uh, they said that uh, these are the representatives of the Baltic states, uh, La Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Poland. And Russia was with the minimum indicator, nearly uh, nearly absent. And, um, uh, we formulated on a broader basis. We just want to get uh, the information about uh, uh, broader attitudes. So uh, whether there should be such an act uh, to establish peace. So the formats can differ. And uh, Ukrainian side, uh, there is idea that diplomats promote that there should be some uh, un uh, entity, some uh, force that will help to um, uh, keep, uh, that will uh, uh, promote peacekeeping. And uh, we just assess what is the idea of people, whether they believe it, it is needed on the whole. They show in Ukraine that the ideal model of Croatia, but there are different opinions to that model. In uh, Croatia, I spoke about a compromise, and uh, so we need to, to find the size of that compromise. Uh, they take as uh, the victory of one uh, party, but uh, from inside, there is a, uh, quite a different opinion. There are lots of people who are not happy. They are not happy with the uh, results of the conflict resolution. Small comment. Very often they ask uh, such a question what to do if uh, tomorrow Putin disappears uh, from Donbass? It's not the right question. So the question should be what should be done if in five, uh, uh, five years Russia will, d will get, will leave Donbass? The answer is uh, uh, simple to give a job to people. So for that we need to run reforms. Slowly, but uh, we need we need those reforms in our country. Thank you. With this, uh, we um, summarize our discussion. On behalf of all the organizations, I would like to thank uh, you for the participation. As you see, of three, four organizations, not always we agree. On everything, but such discussions uh, are extremely important, in my opinion. That's why we'll be happy to see you 
uh, in the future we'll have a lot of work to do. Thank you.